This episode of Fearless Rebel Radio is brought to you by You On Fire. You On Fire is the amazing 12-week online group coaching program that I run where we build up your worth from the ground up so that it's no longer hinging on the way that you look. It's got personalized coaching from me and incredible community support plus lifetime access. Get details on what's included in this program and sign up to be notified when doors open for the next cycle by going to some summerinandin.com forward slash you on fire. I would love to have you in that program and in that group. This is Fearless Rebel Radio, a podcast about body positivity, self-worth, anti-dieting and feminism. I am your host, Summer Inanin, a professionally trained coach specializing in body image, self-worth and confidence and the best-selling author of Body Image Remix. If you're ready to break free of societal standards and stop living behind the number on your scale, then you have come to the right place. Welcome to the show. This is episode 147, and it's another and final installment of Classic Rebel Radio, where we are revisiting an episode from the past while I'm on maternity leave. Today, we are revisiting the interview I did with Tara Moore, author of Playing Big, an expert on women's leadership and well-being, on how to be more loyal to your dreams than your fears, managing self-doubt, and how to unhook from praise and criticism. And I'll be answering a listener question on how to respond to diet talk. You can find the links and resources mentioned in this episode at summerinandin.com forward slash 147. And this is the final classic Rebel Radio episode while I am on maternity leave. And uh, I would love to be able to tell you what's to come. But (laughs) at the time of this recording, I haven't had my baby yet. So I'm not quite sure. So hopefully you are uh, getting my email updates because that's the best place to find out that kind of information and following me on social media. You can get my email updates by downloading the Body Confidence Makeover at summerinandin.com forward slash freebies. And you can follow me on social media to always be updated on the latest news from my life. Anyways, before we start this final classic Rebel Radio episode, I just want to give a shout out to Mrs. B who left this great review. This podcast is so very important for anyone who is searching for body image help. I listen religiously and I owe a lot of the progress I've made in recovery to Summer and her guests. Do yourself a favor and give it a listen. Awesome. Thank you so much for that review. You can leave a review by heading to iTunes, searching for Fearless Rebel Radio, then click ratings and reviews and click to leave a review or give it a rating. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the show via iTunes or whatever platform you use. And as I said, get the 10 day body confidence makeover at summerinandin.com forward slash freebies with 10 steps to take right now to feel better in your body. Before we start with this episode, I have a question from Gemma. I hope you are winding down for maternity leave and I wish you all the best. Yay, I am at the time of this recording. It's my last week of work. Oh my God. So my question is, my family is obsessed with the idea of good and naughty food and will not eat a slice of cake without exclaiming how bad they are and promising that they will be good tomorrow. It drives me up the wall, but I stay silent. I've been trying to think of a non-confrontational throwaway line I can use in these situations to save them. Do you have any suggestions? Oh, this is diet culture. So we can't blame your family for speaking the way that they're speaking because it's the language that they've been taught to speak. Unfortunately, if you're open to it, and I know this is not necessarily what you're asking for because you're asking for a throwaway line, but if you are open to it, I would say, you know, maybe can you like pull them aside and say, do you mind if we don't talk about food in that way? It's just not helpful for my recovery or you know I don't believe we should really be instilling this idea that food is good or bad but if if you're not up for that because I know you mentioned that you don't want to be confrontational which is fine as well but if you want to set some boundaries that is what I suggest so if you want to throw away line um the first thing that comes to my head is this meme and I think it's by the Instagram account me my ed art or something like that I'm not quite sure. I tried to find the meme again, but I could not find it. But I think that's who created it, if if I'm recalling from my memory. Anyways, it's this awesome meme and it says something like, and again, I'm paraphrasing, so I'm totally butchering this, but it's not like you burned down an orphanage, Susan. You're not bad. So something like that. <laughs> so you could use that or some variation to just diffuse it and plant the seed that they are not bad for eating food. So it could be like, it's not like you murdered a kitten. So you can use something like that, or you could say something that if a little, that's a little more direct, like 
eating cake does not make you a bad person. It might just be like a broken record. <laughs> you have to repeat it every time. So that's, I kind of like the comedic throwaway line a little bit better, which is, I think is what you were asking for. But like I said, if you want to open up a discussion around it, maybe it's one-on-one, -on -one, you could say something like, there's nothing wrong with eating cake. I used to feel guilty when I ate it too, but I've learned how to let go of that. If you ever want to know more, let me know. I'm happy to chat with you about it. So those are some things that you could try. And instead of, instead of letting it get to you, just remember this is not about you. They have just been indoctrinated into this language. It's not their fault either. Um, hopefully they will come to see the light one day. Hopefully you will be the role model and the change that they need to see to want to change as well. And just try to appreciate that you're not in that place anymore. So if you can really look at it like, okay, wow, I'm so glad I don't feel that way anymore. Because at one point, I'm guessing you probably did. We all, we all did. I know I certainly did. All right, let's revisit this episode with Tara. Tara was one of my mentors. I use her techniques in my coaching. I'm certified with her playing big facilitators training course. And so I uh, just love her work. I love the book Playing Big. And it had a huge influence on me and definitely the way that I, that I coach clients. So I think you'll enjoy this discussion. Check it out. Hello, everybody. Today, I am talking to a very special special guest. She had a profound influence in my life and has been one of my mentors, and I'm honored that she is here today. I'd like to welcome Tara Moore to the show today. Tara is an expert on women's leadership and well-being. She helps women play bigger in sharing their voices and bringing forward their ideas and work and in life. She is the author of Playing Big, Practical Wisdom for Women Who Want to Speak Up, Create, and Lead, named a Best Book of the Year by Apple's iBooks, and she is the creator of the Playing Big Leadership Program for Women, as well as the Playing Big Facilitators Training for coaches, therapists, leadership development professionals, and other practitioners supporting women in their personal and professional growth. Welcome to the show, Tara. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Summer. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes. And so I participated in your playing big facilitators training um, about a year ago now. And as I was saying to you before we started recording, it was probably one of the best investments I've ever made in my in my personal development, um, as well as my professional development. But the, the personal side of it astounded me it has as to how much I, I got out of it and continue to, to use, you know, the, the concepts and tools that, that you taught, that you taught me. And so I just, um, oh, that just means gonna... so much to me and it's so gratifying to hear that. So yes. And my clients, I mean, it's just, it's filtered to like the, the many, many women that I've, that I've coached since having, um, had you, uh, you know, be that, be that mentor and, and learn the concepts of playing big. So, um, yeah, your, your influence has been widespread within my community as well as within my life. And, and I'm sure the people around me appreciate that I've changed as a result of everything that you taught as well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My favorite recent anecdote on that friend is someone who was just sharing on Facebook, another participant from our facilitators training was saying how much they got out of the program and how much they use it. And then the next, the first comment on the Facebook share was, and this is her mother. And I can absolutely vouch for that Tara that <laughs> she has changed so much since doing this program. That <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. I've never had the like mother injected comment before. Oh, mom, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that. I feel like that 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 is like one that you're gonna have to screen capture and save. <laughs> I did. I'm like, how do I cap this? Is this so so like? And of course, the daughter, you know, gracefully took it in stride. Just like press the like button. Like, okay, mom. <laughs> And that is why my mother is not on Facebook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she reads my blog. That's about as far as she gets. <laughs> so I'd love, I'd love for people who maybe aren't familiar with your work, I'd love you to start out by, by telling our listeners how you got into the work that you do and what inspired you to help women share their voices and messages. Yeah, well, there's a lot of different places, of course, that that story could start. Like all of us, there's so many different places along the way, layers that our stories could start with. Um, but for me, from very early in my girlhood, I was extremely pained by, upset by, 
um, the way that women's voices were so often missing. And I would go to school and notice, wow, you know, we haven't talked about women all year in history class. Like they were there. Why aren't we talking about them? You know, and why aren't we reading any books by women in English class? And why, you know, when I go with my family to religious services, are there no women up in front of the congregation? I would notice all of those things. And um, it always really pained me. And I always, uh, not only did it pain me, but I felt kind of like, I want to do something about that. I feel inspired to do something about that. So from, from early in my life, that, that interest in sort of how to add women's voices back where they're missing was always with me. And I pursued it in a lot of different ways, whether, you know, I would be the one in charge of the women's student organization in elementary school or middle school, um, that kind of thing, um, and did different projects around women's issues. And I also, for my whole life, had a huge interest in psychology, in personal growth, and in spirituality, and really how our inner lives shape um, our lives. And that is something that I really got from my mother, who was a just a devoted personal student of psychology and mysticism, and raised me, you know, I, I joke, but it's not really a joke because it's true. Like raised me analyzing my dreams at the breakfast table every morning and talked to me about unconscious motivations, you know, from the time I was like asking her, why are kids chasing each other on the playground and teasing each other? So I had this, this other strain of my interests in that area and, and how I was raised really to look at the world kind of through a very psychological lens. I find that so fascinating that at such a young age, you, you notice the inequality in, in, uh, and the absence of, of women's voices and, and in throughout, like whether it was learning in your history class or your English class, or I, I think that's, did you, was your mom, did your mom inspire you to, to notice that? Or was that just, did you just notice that? I think she was very um, encouraging and welcoming of those observations. I don't remember her proactively talking to me about it, but it was certainly something that um, was welcomed if I brought it up. And in my dad, with my dad as well, you know, my dad was like a, a huge advocate of um, of women women's empowerment, and um, he was always, you know, so excited when there was a new woman leader in his company or when the first woman CEO happened at his company. So I I always got the message that that was okay to notice and talk about and and even important. Um, but I wouldn't say I got that from my parents. You know, that was something I think about how my, my soul came into this world, what I was noticing and felt drawn toward. Mm -hmm. I love that. So good. And I would love you to talk about what does it mean to play big? Yes. So, so kind of to make a long story short. So when I came out of graduate school, I, I was working another career in philanthropy and I started to get very serious with myself about what I really want to do. It's probably not working in a foundation, writing grant memos my whole life and what happened to my real passions for spirituality and psychology and women's issues. And I, without really knowing where my career path was going, I I thought, you know, just as a next step, I'll get trained as a coach because I know that will kind of take me into that personal growth direction. And I started coaching women and working on the side of my full-time job. I would coach in the evenings and on the weekends. And I started to see this, very clear pattern with all of the women who were showing up in my coaching practice, which was that they were incredibly inspiring to me. I was just so moved by, they were ethical, they were caring, they had ideas, really great ideas for their companies and their industries and for our world. And I was like, you're incredible. Like, and our world would be so much better if you were in charge instead of the buffoons being in charge. And like, And at the same time that I was noticing all that, I was hearing from them so much self-doubt, so much self-criticism, so much I'm not ready yet. Like the gulf between the talent and potential that I saw and what they felt about themselves was huge. Mm -hmm. And so that was what I started to talk about as 
us playing small, which is a term I found very quickly, you know, clearly really resonated with women that they felt they were playing small. They knew they were playing small. Um, and, and I started to really think about and make my coaching practice a laboratory to discover what helps women play bigger. And my definition of playing bigger is not, you know, that you get the corner office or that you do the thing that everybody else perceives as big, but rather playing big to me is that you're more loyal to your dreams than to your fears and that your life is about having your own back in going for what you want. Doesn't mean you figure it all out or you get it necessarily, but you definitely have your own back with it and you're on your own side. You're not, you're no longer playing the skeptic in relationship to your heart. And uh, that's, that was the beginning of that work around playing big and, and playing small. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's good to, to kind of define that because I think, you know, playing big, it looks different for every woman. I mean, my, my personal experience with it and my definition of playing big is, is going to be different than, than somebody else's. And I think that, um, you know, the, your, your, the concepts in, in your book lend to whatever your playing big dream is. Exactly. And sometimes, you know, to be totally honest, that was hard for me to accept at first because I did also have this agenda of my own, this passion of my own, where I wanted to see more women in leadership and I wanted to see us get over the barriers that prevent us from going for the big roles and going for the big power positions. But what I found is that when you give women that toolkit to um, get in touch with their own inner wisdom and get over being run by their inner critic, you know, the, all the, the toolkit that is now kind of the playing big model. Some people, some fraction do that big leadership thing because that's what is on their playing big path. But just as many women will say, you know, that's, it's, it's been fear and shoulds and, other people's agendas for me that has, is what's kept me on that prestigious achieving path. And my true playing big is going and doing this creative thing or doing this entrepreneurial thing or scaling back or, you know, sometimes spending more time with my family. That's what t the real courageous move for me looks like. And so, you know, it became part of my job to really both help people discern when is that real? When is that just to cover for fear? But a lot of times it is real. And then, you know, it's my job to accept it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I think my mother's definition of playing big for me is very different than what it, <laughs> than what it is. Like having, I was in the corporate world. I had like the, you know, the, the office and the car and like the job, you know, like six figures and stuff. And I left it all because I wanted to do the work that I do now. Like I wanted to help women with, with, body image and to, you know, to, to play their, you know, to, to, to be who they want to be, like in essence to play, to play big and whatever that means for them. And so, um, yeah, I just, I think that, you know, it, it looks different on everyone. And I think for me too, sometimes playing big means like taking a step back and giving myself a, an entire day off to do nothing because so much, so much of the time can be like, so, a lot of our work can be driven by fear and shoulds, like you said. Right. Right. I mean, what we're really talking about is the the bigness of our, our individual uh, destined paths, the bigness of our individual callings, the courage that it takes to listen to our own inner voice instead of the norms of our culture or what's expected around us. I mean, that's the true journey at the heart of playing big. And I think for all of us, it always does lead to more more creative flourishing and more generativity and more fulfillment. But, um, that doesn't always look like, you know, what our culture considers achievement. Um, and it certainly doesn't always look like it right away. That's so true. And I want to talk about self doubt cause I know, um, managing self doubt is a huge part of, of, the playing big model and, you know, being more loyal to your dreams, actually taking action to go after your dreams. And I think there's, you know, this, there's this idea in our culture that we can get rid of self doubt, you know, like people will say like, Oh, you just got to shut your inner, inner critic down, but that's not necessarily true. And I'd love you to elaborate on the relationship between self doubt and playing big. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So there's all this um, celebration of confidence and the idea of confidence. And naturally, we all want girls and women to be confident. And I think that's a very normal longing that we have for each other. Like we see the pain and suffering that women are going through around their own self-criticism and self-doubt. And we say, no, you know, it would be better. It would be better. It would be more right and more just if you were, if you felt confident in yourself, you deserve to. So that's, I think, you know, it's, it comes from a healthy inclination that we encourage people to be confident. And we, you know, we say that a lot, but it's, it actually is misguided. Um, and it's misguided for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> One is that, even take away any gender lens, but just for human beings, if you are sharing your voice, if you are proposing an idea, if you are bringing an innovation into the world, if you are um, doing anything that is in that, you know, I'm, I'm following my own inner direction on my own playing big path and bringing something forth as a result of that. It is very natural that your safety instinct, your emotional safety instinct does not like that. That brings a risk of criticism, of rejection, of ridicule, of failure. And so your safety instinct wants to avoid all of those things and just stay in the comfort zone. And it's got to think of a way to try and get you to stay in the comfort zone. And the way it does that usually is by taking on the um, disguise, kind of taking on the manifestation of the inner critic voice and saying, Oh, you're not prepared enough for that. That's going to be horrible. Um, your work isn't the right fit for that venue. You know, it'll come up with all kinds of very reasonable sounding protective, um, ways to rationalize you out of doing that thing. But really all it's trying to do is get you to stay in the comfort zone. And that's true for all of us. You know, there's that part of us that does not want the vulnerability that comes with showing up. And that part intimidates us through the inner critic voice. So that means we're all going to feel self-doubt when we're doing anything important in terms of our voice and our contribution in the world. And then on top of that, you add that for women, we have a dearth of role models of seeing women do that. We know that the stakes are higher for women in terms of the kinds of criticism we get when we share ourselves. Um, all these kind of other factors we've been socialized to people. Please. So our self-doubt gets even heightened and has um, kind of a whole nother layer to it. So as you're saying, Summer, our approach in the playing big model is we're not trying to get over having self-doubt. We're not trying to be you know, unfailingly confident. We are really trying to learn how do we hear the voice of the inner critic but not take direction from it. So that we can hear that voice. Oh, I hear the voice saying, you know, this is going to be a disaster. This is going to be a disaster. This is going to be a disaster. This already is a disaster. This is a disaster right now. And I'm able in that moment to say, wow, that voice sounds really true. I have reason enough to believe I think it's my inner critic. Um, it feels really true and urgent right now, but I'm actually going to choose to take direction from a different part of myself. And then we walk forward as that voice is ranting and raving anyway. Yeah, I think you described it as being like a rock star with self-doubt. Yes. I always, um, instead of just like picturing your future self that's, you know, fulfilling all your dreams as a confident rock star, just picture yourself as a self-doubt, a rack with self-doubt rock star. Like that's <laughs> fun too. <laughs> That's been so helpful for me, though, you know, like, I that was one of the biggest things. And I think one of the biggest things for me was really understanding the 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 protection mechanism of it and understanding that it is our our voice of, of protection, because that allowed me to be a lot more compassionate and tender with it instead of angry with it. And, um, you know, feeling like, oh, my God, I just need to like put in earplugs and, and right. just like blast music to make this thing quiet down. And it's the attempt at protection. So it's like a, it's a misguided attempt at protection. It's a protective instinct, but it's very overreactive. It's very irrational. It's only worried about risk. It doesn't care whether you have a happy or fulfilled day in your life. It just wants you to avoid all risk. Yeah. That's something I've really, even since the book came out in my own life, I've put more emphasis on that, looking at the protective 
function so that whenever I'm hearing my inner critic now, I'll often, my sort of go-to tool is now to ask myself, what would my, what is my safety instinct not like about this situation? Mm -hmm. And I can always, it's like, Oh, of course, what? Of course it doesn't like this. You know, like you're contemplating going on stage in front of X number of people, or you're contemplating writing for this venue where, you know, you're going to get a lot of criticism, even if people like this, you know, or whatever. It's like, I can immediately see, Oh, here's what would feel risky. And here's why the inner critic would be trying to get me to not do that thing. And then it's like, Oh, okay. I understand what it's afraid of. And I understand that's not the fear that I want to have making my decisions. And then we move forward. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, for me, I, like, I picture my inner critic as like my like 12 year old, like self-conscious self that's like sitting in the kitchen trying to do her homework and like, <laughs> was, <laughs> you know, was like ashamed so many times at that age or like made fun of for stuff. And like, she never wants to feel that way again. So she like shows up to, to be like, don't do it summer. Like we never want to feel that way again. And I think that's been really helpful for me to kind of see it as like, well, no wonder I feel that way because, you know, we've all experienced moments of, um, you know, embarrassment or criticism and it hurts like regardless it's, you know, it's going to hurt. Um, and that, you know, that contributes to why, why, why I think that voice shows up. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So are there gender differences for self doubt? Like how, how does that show up differently for men versus women? Well, so this was an interesting discovery for me because I thought, you know, based on what I was observing just in my friends and the women and men I knew and all of that, I was like, sure, you know, that women were grappling with a whole lot more self-doubt than men. Um, And especially like I live in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of confident men around, you know, and sometimes you just watch kind of the way they look at the world and what they do. And it's like, that is a different universe. And a lot of it has to do with the lack of self doubt. Mm -hmm. So that was my sort of anecdotal perception. And then when I was working on the book, I really dived into the academic research um, and found one, I mean, it's shocking how little research there is on confidence and self doubt. It's, it's not a topic that has been given a ton of attention yet in psychology. Um, there's a lot more on something called self-efficacy, which is not really the same thing. So the research is sparse, but, um, of the research that has been done, there really isn't a consistent gender gap in confidence that is shown. Um, what, what you do see is that there's gap, there's a gender gap that shows up, um, around particular skills and abilities. And so, um, things that are associated with masculinity in our culture, women feel more self-doubt around. And those things include leadership, quantitative work, so anything numerical, um, financial work, science, uh, negotiation. So, you know, you can sort of think of what's stereotypically the kinds of work, the abilities associated with maleness in our culture, women will feel a lot more self-doubt about themselves in those areas. And they'll usually think it's personal. Like I'm just not, I'm not a good negotiator. You know, they don't realize it's part of a macro pattern. And then on the other side of the equation, there's a little bit of research that suggests that men feel more self-doubt than women around things that are associated with femininity in our culture, like listening skills, relationship skills and communication. Hmm. And do, I, I feel like these become almost like self-fulfilling prophes- prophecies a lot of the time because women just assume, you know, like, oh, women aren't good at technology or women are, you know, good at math and science. And uh, I, I feel like there was a study done that showed that, like when women are given information, like you are as good as at mm-hmm. math as men, that they perform better than when they're told they're not. Is yeah. That, are you yeah. familiar there's, with that? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of research around that and, and the whole body. If, if anybody's interested in that, just Google stereotype threat. Um, there's, that's the phenomenon where if you sort of invoke a, a negative stereotype for someone, um, about that, that applies to their group, like let's say you're about to have girls do a math test and then you somehow prompt for them the idea that, um, boys are better at math and it could just be as simple as having them like have to write out their gender at the top of the test or something. 
that will affect their performance. Um, and, and then there's, you know, amazing studies on the opposite side where if you have a math, a female math professor delivering the test, you get completely different results from the women in the room than if you have a male professor delivering the test. Um, all of these little cues really affect how we, how we see ourselves and then that affects our ability. So fascinating. And I think body perfectionism is one of the ways that self-doubt really shows up for women as well. What has your experience with that been like? Oh, my experience with body perfectionism. That starts when I was like three years old. (laughs) (laughs) It's definitely been, you know, a big um, journey in my life. Um, And, you know, today I would say, I very much look at it in the, in the lens that, well, one of the ways I look at it is in terms of what we're talking about today, that, you know, I will notice, for example, like if, if in my career, I have a big new opportunity, like let's say, um, something's coming up and I'm going to be on national television and I will have had, you know, no body image issues for a long time. And it's been fairly quiet and peaceful, but all of a sudden that obsessive thinking will be there of like, we'll do it. You know, I need to get in this shape before the date and how are things going to fit and nothing in my body's not okay. And I now look at that as, okay, that's, that's a manifestation of inner critic and that therefore is a manifestation of safety instinct. Mm -hmm. So why is my inner critic speaking up now? What is my safety instinct not like about the situation? Oh, you know, my safety instinct doesn't like that we're going on live television in front of 3 million people. That is freaking scary. What if I say the wrong thing? What if my points don't come out? What if it doesn't go well, you know? And so the body image conversation in my head becomes this huge distraction from the what's really uncomfortable about that, which has nothing to do with, you know, whether the scale goes up or down a little bit before that date, but really has to do with showing up and being visible and sharing my voice in front of that kind of audience. And my safety instinct would like to, you know, take me away from, take me away from that. So that's, you know, I think the function it's, it's plays Mm -hmm. this kind of, um, let's take you away from your playing big path. Let's take you away from the real, uncomfortable feelings of vulnerability around sharing your voice and the excitement and joy of that and kind of shut it all down into this very familiar self-critical pattern that you never can really finish being in because you can never be successful at achieving its goals. So true. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's such an important um, thing. Well, I know a lot of the listeners that listen to this show that are hearing this, like that's going to be a really key piece of information is that, you know, that voice of body perfectionism is often like a distraction from, from something else. And so, um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Cause I know, I know you had talked about that before and I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that we touched on that as well. Um, I would love to talk to you about the, why women are socialized to be people pleasers. So in my experience, both with clients and in my own life, you know, our fear of like, what will others think is one of, you know, one of the main reasons why we do play small. And one of the things that resonated with me so much was understanding the history around why women want to be likable. So can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, yeah. Well, this was a big kind of realization for me too, um, that happened in the, in the first couple of years that I was teaching the playing big course. And in the course we have a module that I call unhooking from praise and criticism and unhooking from praise and criticism is about looking at where am I so dependent on praise or so seeking of praise that it's getting in the way of my playing big or where am I so scared of criticism or wounded by criticism or avoiding of criticism that I'm not doing what I feel called to do. I'm not sharing ideas that might be controversial and so on. So, um, in the unhooking from praise and criticism conversations we'd have in the course, um, I would sometimes be coaching women around a kind of a particular criticism they're afraid of getting. Like someone is wants to start a new business and 
tells that her approach is going to be kind of innovative and a little controversial probably. And she's thinking through like getting in touch with, oh, you know, one of the reasons I'm not doing this is because I'm afraid of what people are going to say and I'm afraid of their reaction. That would be one example. Or another would be, you know, I need to someone on my team and I'm really afraid of the criticism that's going to come my way from that person and others once I do that. And as I was talking to women about those kinds of fears, I started to notice that their voices would be just trembling on the other side of the phone line. Like, and I, the impression I was getting was like, oh my gosh, they sound like they feel like their lives are threatened. They Mm -hmm. sound like they feel like this criticism is life threatening, almost like a string kind of quality and I really you know I could think of things in my life that I hadn't done or criticism that I had gotten that was so wounding that I was just like it, it feels intolerable to the point of it's like it's not survivable so that really perplexed me because in the course we touch on a lot of other deep topics and I didn't I was kind of like, why am I hearing more fear and trembling with this than anything else? And so I kind of went and thought about that myself for a while. And then I realized, oh, right. Like, if you look at our history as women, for most of the past few thousand years, right, we could not depend on legal means to protect ourselves if our um, safety was threatened. We didn't have political rights to help protect ourselves. We couldn't own financial property. So if we needed to store away resources to escape or to ensure our survival or the survival of our loved ones, we couldn't do that. We weren't surviving based on our physical strength. We were probably less strong physically than those around us. So how did we actually survive? You know, what did we do when our survival was threatened? Well, the primary strategy we had at our disposal was uh, social, social influence, likability, doing what was approved of, doing what would be okay. We really couldn't rock the boat in any significant way and be safe. And so um, today receiving criticism can feel life-threatening for a lot of us because for most of our history, it really was life-threatening for women. Um, And that's in us, I think, at a cellular level. And we may have also heard messages that really spoke to that from our mothers or grandmothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, we're, because of that, like we're wired to want to avoid social rejection. And so, you know, we do that by conforming to all of the different norms. And I think, you know, with, with feminine standards, a lot of those come down, um, a lot of those take the the formation of beauty standards and which then causes like this, this manifestation of, um, you know, women always comparing their bodies to others. Like, how do I measure up? And thinking that we need to fit a certain ideal in order to control our destiny and control our success and control our happiness. And I think, you know, when I was able to really look at it, like through this like broader social lens, when I was able to really look at like the history of it, um, as you had, um, talked about it in, in the program and in, in your book, I was like, Oh my God, like, this is just, you know, this is the way that we've been wired. And so no wonder it feels so uncomfortable. Like our, our brain is wired to make that uncomfortable for us. Right. Right. Yes. And I, it, that's a really, I'm so glad you made that connection because that connection between I'm going to do what's like of and approve of, and then I'm going to actually have to somehow change my physical shape and form to be that. Um, and you really do, you know, there is a kind of ostracization, um, especially I think we experience it in girlhood and adolescence and, you know, all of that in school. If you break that norm, um, you know, and I, I would include myself in that as someone who, um, you know, was like an overweight kid, um, on and off and, um, went through puberty at a very, very young age and just like, didn't look, you know, and, and was in an ethnic minority relative to everyone that I was in school with. And, 
Um, I definitely, I mean, that is, that was a high stakes, dangerous place to be like that, um, involved a lot of shame and a lot of, um, you know, potential. It's interesting. Cause I kind of did it while like figuring out how to be a popular girl all the way, but, right. um, the threat, it was kind of like, you could just fall right off the cliff at any moment. And I knew that, you know, and it, it felt like I was a centimeter away from that cliff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, I know for me, understanding that, that, that bigger perspective of it, it really almost gave me permission to be like, well, then I'm just going to break the rules. Like my, my survival is not dependent on, on whether somebody likes me anymore. And, um, I don't know. I just found that so, so helpful for me. And I know like some of the, you know, my clients and stuff, when I've, when I've explained that to them, like, you know, it's because you're wired this way, but you don't have to be that way anymore. Like as women, our survival is not dependent on anybody else. Like we can be independent and take care of ourselves and do what we want to do. It's really, you know, it's really gratifying to hear that. And it's something I've been noticing. It's gratifying for me because that is something that that thought about our history and how it relates to how we are now, you know, just came for me out of listening to people and then thinking about it. I didn't read it anywhere. I didn't hear, you know, it just felt, It was very organic and it was one of those things. And I think we all have this in our playing big journey where you have a thought or something you want to say, and you've never really heard anyone else say it before. And then you're like, does this make any sense? You know, and like, and I find that the things that I feel that way about that kind of sound odd to me at first, because they're not, you know, they're just, they're coming from an internal source. They're, they're very like fresh for me those are often the things that I end up noticing resonate the most with people. And this one would be one included too, where, um, you know, summer in my program, as you know, at the end, everybody does an assessment where they write about what they learned and stuff. And I noticed when I was reading the assessments, every single person hit on that point. It was probably the only point that every single person really hit on. Mm -hmm. Like it stuck with everybody and everybody articulated it very clearly Um, and I just found that so moving, you know, that, um, and it's good. It's a good lesson for all of us who are creating and putting things into the world because we have to listen to those thoughts that come to us that don't really make sense to us first. That's what our contribution is meant to be. Yeah. And I know, um, like in the book and the program, you talk about, you know, like hiding the way that we hide. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, I think hiding is so normalized in our culture, like, or just in our being, you know, like if we have an idea that we've never heard before, like we're, we're like, well, I can't share that. Cause that must not be true. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> better go research it first and see if anybody else said it. And then, <laughs> yeah. And it's funny. Cause like I get to hear as the recipient of everybody's like, you know, inner critic dialogues, it's like, I hear all sides of it. So I hear like, well, that can't possibly be good, good idea because nobody said it. But then I know, you know, the other, t- the other group of people who did find people who say similar things are like, well, now there's no point in me saying it because everyone else is already saying it. You know, it's like, I'm too young. I'm too old. It's like, it just, you know, it goes all the way around. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, the whole core concept of like unhooking from praise and criticism, I mean, it's, it's huge. We could record like (laughs) a few shows just on that concept, (laughs) but I would love to know, like, you know, what's something that women can do, do to begin to unhook from praise and criticism? Yes. Well, um, my favorite kind of, um, principle to talk about around this is that, um, feedback can never tell you anything about yourself. It can only tell you about the person giving the feedback. Mm -hmm. And that's usually a really hard one for people to swallow at first because what feedback is supposed to be so great and it's going to help me learn and it's going to help me grow. And then a lot of times now I'm doing corporate, you know, speaking engagements where feedback is so big in the culture and they have performance reviews every five minutes where everybody's giving each other feedback. And then I come in and say, feedback can never tell you anything about yourself, (laughs) about the person giving the feedback. Um, But, but I really believe that's true. And I also believe it's not at odds with learning and growing from feedback. So what I mean by that is, you know, if your boss says to you, you're a great team leader, but you're also a little bit disorganized. Okay. So does that tell us anything about you? Does that tell us you're a great team leader? 
Does that tell us you're a little disorganized? It really doesn't. It tells us two things about what your boss thinks. Mm-hmm. And if we investigate that a little more, we might find, oh, it tells us some things about your boss's expectations or what your boss thinks organized look like or what your boss's definition of a good team leader is like and so on. And, and if 10 bosses tell you the same thing over the course of your career, that also doesn't really tell us anything about you. It tells us about what comes across to your bosses, like what makes it over the transom to what, what lands on the other side, which may or may not have anything to do with what's actually going on. It may tell you something about what's expected in your industry or in the culture of the organization where those reviews happen. So we can still take feedback really seriously, listen to it. We get very curious about it. We want to incorporate it if we want to work effectively with the people who are giving us the feedback. But we're incorporating it as um, strategically useful information about the people that we want to work with or that we want to influence or reach, not as information about ourselves. And that allows us to not go on an emotional roller coaster with it. Um, And it's just, it's so important for women in particular because a lot of the feedback we get is gendered, does include bias, um, does reflect the way that a lot of times our professions ask us to conform to norms that were really created by and for men. So we have to take that feedback in context. This isn't this isn't a referendum on me. This is telling me something about what this what's valued in this company culture or what this boss wants. And if I want to thrive here, I'm gonna maybe make some adjustments to accommodate that, but not because I believe this means, you know, there's something deficient about me. Mm-hmm. That one was so huge for me and to take it um, you know, even bigger of like, okay, um, you know, what does this feedback tell me about like the culture that we live in and, you know, and like the beliefs that this person must have had as it relates to, you know, like the, the, you know, the social upbringing that they had. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that that was that (laughs) it, it's come up for me so much, um, in my own, like, you know, playing big journey with like, I, you know, had a book that came out in November and, you know, being able to, to, you know, sift through the reviews from a place of like observation and curiosity and not, not from a place of like, what does this say about me as a person? Right. Um, You know, that piece of information about like the feedback doesn't say anything about you. It only gives you information about the person giving the feedback was like life changing I think, because it just was able, you know, your criticism is still going to hurt. Praise is still going to feel good, but um, it's not like internalized as, as like defining me anymore. Right. And think about, you know, for you to be able to read your book reviews with that kind of curiosity, think about how much fuel and insight you can get from those reviews. You're learning a ton about your market. You're learning like so much about where people's resistances are and what they get and what they don't get. And like that's, that gives you so much power to create the next thing that's going to serve them even better or to discern, okay, this subset is my customer and this subset isn't. Like that's giving you all this fuel for what you do next. Whereas if you sit there and read those reviews as, you know, the um, authoritative like declaration on whether you measure up as a writer or a person or not, you'll get nothing useful out of it and you'll get totally stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been, I mean, that's been so helpful. And I think even just in like everyday conversations, um, you know, whether it's someone in your life makes a comment about you, um, you know, it's, it's being able to, to really just reframe it in that way of like, well, what does that tell me about them? You know, and you get to decide on what, whether, you know, that matters to you or that doesn't, or what what you want to do with that information. Right. So how can women define what playing big looks like for them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, there's there's kind of two avenues we take in the playing big model as for that. One is your inner mentor. So finding your inner mentor. And your inner mentor is a vision of yourself 20 or 30 years out into the future. And we don't just sit for a second and say, hmm, who do I want to be 20 years in the future? Because that will not go well. I can tell you now. <laughs> Don't bring anything interesting or new. It'll be like your ego's projections slash your fears of aging, like <laughs> manifest in a person. Well, there's a guided visualization and meditation 
um, that we do in the book and in the courses um, that helps you meet her and really get in touch with something deeper than what you would get to in your everyday thinking. And your inner mentor is really like your more authentic. It's, it's not just your older self. It's your more authentic self. And um, Summer, you could talk about your inner mentor to paint the picture, I'm sure. Um, and, and, and she tells you a lot about what your true playing big looks like. She's like a more self-actualized version of you or, um, to borrow a metaphor from Joseph Campbell, if you're the acorn, she's the oak. Mm -hmm. So this is what, you know, there's a blueprint in you to become this more fully expressed, um, version of yourself as her. So discovering her is, is one big way. Um, and then the other is we talk about when playing big, we talk about callings and that everybody gets lots of callings. And, um, in a very practical way, we break down, how do you, how do you know what your calling is and how can you start living it no matter what your responsibilities and your, um, day-to-day challenges are. And that, you know, starting to really embrace and live your callings is, um, another, another doorway into you're playing big. Yeah. And both of those tools have been extremely helpful for me. And yeah, my, my inner mentor is like very hippied out. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite there yet, but I did move to Vancouver. So <laughs> getting closer, that's for sure. <laughs> All about getting closer, right? It's just, we never fully get there with her. Yeah. So as we wrap things up here, um, I usually ask my guests, like, what is the most fearless thing that you've done? But I'm going to rephrase that to what is the biggest playing big leap that you've taken? <laughs> <laughs> Let me say the most fearless thing I've done is labor, but that's another story. <laughs> that, that would count for sure. The biggest playing big. Well, so it's kind of interesting because, OK, I could go on a whole tangent here, but, you know, in playing big, we take it's really about small leaps, not big leaps. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll share like, so a leap, um, or a, a kind of playing big, um, move for me right now. Um, that's been really, really interesting is, um, I'm really growing my team and, in doing that, I, it's both a big inner move because I'm an only child. I tend to be a very kind of like individually oriented creator. So it's a big growth edge for me to work in a more team oriented way. Um, but also realizing, you know, some of the kind of internal glass ceiling I had about investing um, the money from my business in my own business, mm -hmm. like that, that, that was actually a big, that's okay. And it kind of took me getting really, um, inspired by seeing, you know, some of just the gender gap in how much men tend to raise capital for their ideas and then have a lot of capital to fuel what they want to bring into the world and how much we women entrepreneurs tend to avoid that and kind of, um, and in my case, even when we had a lot of revenue to reinvest, you know, that was actually, I had to kind of break my own inner glass ceiling to do that. So that's been a big one for me lately. Mm, that's fascinating. Yeah. And I think sometimes with women, it's like, we think we can just do it all as well. Like there's this expectation that we should just do it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. Well, where can people find more of you? Well, there's only one of me, but <laughs> <laughs> we want more. <laughs> it's more from me. If not, if not more <laughs> of me, more from me. Um, on taramore.com and um, also on Facebook, Tara Moore. I know that lots of times now people are like, but let me find you on social media. So yeah, Facebook or Instagram, um, and taramore.com. There's lots of free resources. 
And um, I will link to all of that in the show notes, which is going to be at summerinandin.com forward slash FRR dash six one, because this is episode 61. And I will absolutely link to uh, where people can go and buy Playing Big, the book, and um, information on where they can get notified about the upcoming Playing Big programs as well. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Yes. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was uh, fantastic. I'm so glad we we got to do this. And um, I'm just uh, so it's just been so great having you here and getting to chat with you about all of these things. Thank you for all the support and for your very um, thoughtful and heartfelt incorporation of it into your work and your life. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rock on. Hope you enjoyed that one. This is the final installment of Classic Rebel Radio. You can find the links and resources mentioned in this episode at summerinandin.com forward slash 147. I'm hoping to be back with season five of the podcast soon. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm recording this podcast in August 2018. I am... 35 plus weeks pregnant. I have no idea what my life is going to be like by the time this episode actually airs. My plan is to be working again in spring 2019. So who knows, maybe there will be a new podcast in the next week or two. I'm not quite sure at the time that this is air that I'm recording this. But stay tuned for updates via my social media, via my emails. Make sure you're getting my my monthly emails, which have been also been running in syndication while I've been on maternity leave. And uh, Uh, And yeah, who knows? I'll be excited to find out what I actually decide to do. (laughs) But there will definitely be a season five of the podcast. Just not sure the the, uh, start air date yet, but hopefully it's sooner than later. And just just know that I am so grateful to have had you stick around uh, while I've been on maternity leave. And hopefully you've enjoyed these episodes. And I really, really appreciate you being here. And uh, hopefully you'll hear again, hear from me again really soon. Rock on. I'm Summer in and and I want to thank you for listening today. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Summer in and in If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this show. I would be so grateful. Until next time, rock on. Rock on.